Hi everyone, and welcome to what is effectively the third entry in our Acorn Electron series. If you recall, in the first episode, we took a look at the history of the machine and took a good look inside, and ultimately pondered what if on the subject of whether the machine, if released on time and at an aggressive enough price, would have changed the direction of the UK micro market. Would that success have changed the direction of Acorn research machines, and therefore, ultimately, the dominance of ARM today? Part two of the series took the form of an interview with Paul Fellows, lead engineer at Acorn Soft and team lead on the Risk OS project at Acorn at the time this was all happening. And we jointly explored that what if scenario. I won't spoil it for you, it's well worth a watch if you're an Acorn fan. There's a link on the screen if you want to pop off and watch that. So in this long awaited episode, we finally get to fixing a few problems with the machine. If you recall, the eight and the L key don't work and the display flickers on and off like a mad thing, so we need to sort all that. And then of course, we'll need to get the old girl looking lovely again, so some soapy water and elbow grease will be in order. And finally, we'll look at a really useful add-on for the Electron that very cheaply goes some way towards addressing the issues that the machine had at launch, and make owning and using the Electron today a very pleasant experience indeed. So, without further ado, let's crack on. So before we begin our fixathon for this machine, let's make sure we've got all the tools we need. Solder station, check. Desoldering gun, check. Flux, check. Flux pen, solder braid and solder, check. Bridging wire, check. Chip pullers, wire clippers and pliers, check. Screwdriver toolkit, check. Spare capacitors, check. Oscilloscope, check. Signal generator, check. Phew, right. Let's open up the machine and we can look at what we need to do to get her up and running again. If you recall, four screws to remove and then gently remove the keyboard connector. These are more sturdy than most, but replacing them is a pain, so we'll need to be careful here. And I was thinking that the keys might not be working because of a dry solder joint here that we may have to reflow, so we'll add that to the extensive list of repair jobs we're facing. Now, crazy as this sounds, before we get to work with all of those tools we laid out earlier, there's one very special tool that I want to use first of all. And it's this one, my finger. Specifically, pushing and wiggling this chip here, the Ferranti ULA. You see, I found that pushing firmly on that chip while the machine was powered on, everything worked. Everything. If you recall, to keep costs down, the Electron ULA handles pretty much everything, and that means that if this chip doesn't work, we're in trouble. However, it did work with a bit of pressure, so it's likely to just need a reseat. So let's do that. The chip is held in with this clip that is secured at each corner and applies downward pressure to keep the ULA connected to the socket. Removing the clip requires a bit of deft work with a small screwdriver, and then the clip will just ping off. And it's here we can see why this design can cause issues. It's basically gravity and pressure that keep all the pads on the chip in contact with the pins on the socket. Dust, heat, time, sparrows flying by, harsh language can all cause this chip to need putting back in place every now and again. Before we do pop it back in, will give all the socket pins and the contacts on the chip itself a flipping good clean. We'll need to go gentle on the pins as they can be quite fragile, but once we're all clean, we'll make sure the notch on the, oh, hang on, there's no notch here, it's different. The Electron ULA has square cutouts in three of the corners and one rounded corner. So because of the socket design, it only fits in one way, like this, simples, and still, technically notches. So lining it up nicely, we can drop the ULA in, make sure it's seated nice and squarely, and then pop the retaining clip back on, pressing it firmly into place. Popping the machine back together for a quick test shows us that there's no display flicker. The flickering you can see is the differences between the refresh rate of the camera and the CRT. To me, there's no flicker at all. And importantly, all of the keys are working including L and 8. Happy days. Now for the cleanup. 
The main board itself is held in by a further four screws. So let's get those out of the way. And then we can unplug the speaker and the 18 volt feed and return wires that power the edge connector. Take a photo to help you when plugging these back in as they're both the same color. The main board power connector is next. And with that unclipped, the main board will lift straight out and we can set it aside for now. There are three screws that hold the power transformer in place. And oddly, presumably down to cost, the speaker is glued in, but should come free with a little wiggle. Finally, we need to remove the five screws holding the keyboard in place and set that aside also. Now, for those of you who've watched the channel for a while, you'll know that there are two essentials for a good refurb. One is a bowl of soapy water, and the other is Mrs. Retro Shack's finest tea towel, which I've already snaffled, so we're ready to go. So we start by popping off all the keycaps, plopping them into the soapy water, and leave them for a good soak. Uh, don't think too hard about how many fingers have hit those keys over the years, it'll put you off your dinner. But by the time we're finished, we'll be nice and sanitary. It's important to be gentle and take your time with cleaning the case. Although the plastic of these electrons isn't too fragile, we don't want to accidentally snap anything or get too much water on the adhesive stickers. We move to the magic tea towel for the detailing, and this requires stringent usage of a firm bristle brush, getting into all the recesses of the heavily textured plastic on these machines. We've had to work some areas quite heavily here, as goodness knows what was lurking on some bits of this case, but it took a while to shift. Next up is giving the keyboard unit a good dust, and then a few squirts of isopropyl alcohol, and then repeat until we're satisfied. Uh, there was a lot of dust on this unit, so it took a while to finish. Each keycap is then taken out of the soapy water and individually cleaned, wiped and placed on the magic tea towel to dry. Again, you must use a fancy tea towel for this or your results won't be as fancy either. It's back on with the keycaps, and this is one of my favourite bits. It's like a jigsaw, great fun, and a chance to inspect each keycap before it goes back on. Then the completed keyboard goes back into its case, followed by the mainboard, the power transformer, and then it's all screwed back together. And I don't know about you, but I think that's six hours well spent, cleaning up this old machine to, well, let's say nearly new. As there are still a few little dents and scrapes, but that's to be expected of a machine that's nearly 40 years old. I'm really pleased with the way she's turned out, and more importantly, didn't require anything other than a little wiggle to figure out what was wrong with her. So now that she looks the business and is fully working, what was that little gadget I mentioned that I said went some significant way to addressing the issues this machine had at launch? Patience, young Jedi. Before we get to that, there's a tiny little problem that I'd like to address. When recording this, I noticed something. Check out this standard composite output. Notice something strange? Hmm, black and white. Bet there's a mod for that. And as it happens, there is. You want to see it? Want to see it again? Yes, it's closing off link L4 on the mainboard. I thought it best that we didn't just bridge it in case we want to reverse it at some point in the future. So we've installed a nice jumper instead. And look, we now have colour. Yay! Anyway, where were we? Ah yes, addressing some of the issues the base machine had at launch. And yes, I know some of these could be addressed with the plus one, plus three or third party apps and doodars, but there's a modern, simple solution. The Elk 64 SD. And here it is. Plugging straight into the expansion port at the back of the Electron, and fitted with a FAT32 formatted SD card, no bigger than 8GB, which is still more than enough to hold the entire back catalogue of Electron software, this little device gives the Electron an additional 32K of memory, bringing the total to 64K. An inbuilt MMFS or multimedia filing system with ADFS-like commands, and the ability to read and write to virtual disks stored on the SD card, and also, unbelievably, full sideways ROM and RAM functionality, all with the ability to set the memory page at $E00, so that none of the Electron Base32K 
is used by the additional functionality, meaning full compatibility with all software. Oh, and it's only 40 quid, and it's easy to use, and I love it. In this video, I want to cover mainly the ease of use of the storage solution. We'll go over the sideways ROM RAM part of this in an episode to wrap up this chapter of Acorn's history, and covering the BBC Model B coprocessor installation, and then an in-depth look at sideways ROM and RAM application on both the Beeb and this little Elk. So let's talk about storage today. And of course, note that we've got 64K to play with. The Elk 64SD homepage has a link to a Beeb.mmb file, which acts as a container for SSD disk images. And we can see all of those default images with the star dcat command. To virtually insert one of those disks, we use the star din command, followed by a disk number, in this case 300. By issuing the star cat or star dot shortcut, we can see all the files on that particular disk. Inserting another disk and recataloging shows how easy it is to swap from one disk to another. Nice. And what about creating and using our own disks? Well, when we run the standard star dcat command, we can see we have by default around 300 virtual disks as standard. So what if we try to insert a disk that isn't listed, like 500 for example? Well, it appears to load OK, but we can't catalogue it as it's unformatted. Well, that's simple to fix by typing star DOP space R and recataloguing shows us we now have a new empty disk to use. So you all know what comes next. It's the old Dixon special. Uh, let's quickly type that in. So that amazing feat of programming skill appears to work as expected. The manager will be over in a moment to kick us out of the store, no doubt. So before they do, we'll save this program down to the newly formatted disk we created so we can come back and annoy them later too. After a full reset of the machine, we can simply reinsert disk 500, load our program and continue our programming masterpiece, you know, by adding swear words and such. And that's really all I wanted to go through in this episode. The next instalment will wrap up this chapter of Acorn's history with the BBC Micro and the Electron, and I'm tentatively thinking of calling it a lovely pair of nuts, you know, because they're both acorns. Anyway, I do hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you like the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. Please leave your comments below. We always love to read them. And until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.